In the fallout of the economic crisis, one name has come to epitomize both Wall Street's success and public resentment against the financial system. Goldman Sachs, the 140-year-old investment firm, has long been known as an outlier with an indisputable record of financial success. The Times of London recently called the firm the best cash-making machine that global capitalism has ever produced, and some say a political force more powerful than governments. Despite last year's deep recession, the firm posted a $13.4 billion profit, a Wall Street record, and it recorded another $3.5 billion gain for the first quarter of this year, a 91% increase. The firm's influence extends well beyond markets. Two of the last six U.S. Treasury secretaries were Goldman CEOs before they left for government. Despite or perhaps because of this success, the firm has come under attack from both Washington and Main Street. Many point to the billions that it received from AIG after the insurer received a massive bailout from the government. Other critics say that the firm owes more to society after taking advantage of cheap capital provided by the government. More recently, the bank stands accused of deceiving its clients and profiting from the collapse of the housing market. Reports broke late last night that the Justice Department has opened a preliminary criminal investigation into the firm's trading. The news comes just two weeks after the SEC accused the firm of fraud. This has all had a deep impact on Goldman Sachs. Its stock fell over 9 percent today and has dropped 20 percent in just two weeks. Its reputation has been called into question. New York Magazine recently called Goldman America's most successful, cynical, envied, despised Wall Street player. The man who leads this firm is not your typical executive. Lloyd Blankfein was raised in a Brooklyn public housing complex by a postal clerk and a wife who was a receptionist. As a teenager, he sold popcorn and peanuts at Yankee Stadium before attending college. He then got into Harvard Law School. He began his career as an attorney before breaking into investment banking as a commodities trader, one of the most competitive fields in the investment world. Today, in the minds of many, he has come to symbolize Wall Street. On Tuesday, the Senate Money Permanent Subcommittee of Investigations summoned Lord Blankfein and several Goldman executives for nearly 11 hours of sharp questioning. You don't believe it's relevant to a customer of yours that you are selling a security to that you are betting against that same security. You just don't think it's relevant and needs to be disclosed. Is that the bottom line? Yes, and the people who are selling it in our firm wouldn't even know what the firm's position is. And oh, yes, they did. Oh, Sen yes, they Senator, did. We have 35,000 people and thousands of traders making markets throughout our firm. They might have an idea. But they might not have an idea, oh, now, now and the next they might, day it might be different. Yeah. And, and what do you think, by the way, they have an idea, more than an idea in these cases, but putting that aside, what do you think about selling securities which your own people think are crap? Does that bother you? I think they would, again, as a hypothetical. No, so, this is real. Well, then I don't. We heard it today. Well, we heard it today. This is a deal. This is crap. Joining me now is Lord Blankfein, Chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs. I am pleased to have him on this program. Welcome. Thank you, John. Why do you think the public is so outraged? With respect to? With respect to you, your general? firm, with respect to Wall Street, with respect to the financial sector, with respect to government bailouts? I think the financial system failed the American people. I think people on Wall Street did well, carried themselves uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, you know, in a very proud way, some might say haughty way, when things were going well, talked about the contributions they were making to the wider society and to the economy and to the country and to the world. And guess what? When it didn't work well, how could you not blame the people that were getting, that had awfully nice lives when things were going well, how could you not blame them when things turned badly? Then to compound it, meant, you know, people see um, so people see some of the people who did well when things were going well not do so badly when things were going badly. And that absolutely infuriated people. And then that goes into the whole system of whether people's actual compensation was really being correlated to performance. And that led to a situation where how rigged is the game? And so people got very, very, very upset and very, very and angry. what would you say to them? I would say that if you look at this, there's, uh, the anger is... Um, is totally understandable and justified in many cases. Not in every case, yeah. and not in every case to the same extent, but I, you know, I looked at some of the, you know, I, 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 share, I, I share the point of view. 
But I understand now if you ask why Goldman Sachs, there were five big investment banks at the start of this period. Bear Stearns, Lehman, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs. Now there's Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. And given how we performed in the market, there was a lot of focus on us for doing, you know, for doing well. But by the way, we did well largely not because we got this right or that right. We did largely well because we didn't lose as much money when a lot of people were losing money, and not because we were so smart, but because we have you know, discipline with, with, of hedging. On housing, you had the discipline of hedging, and, and you saw early on what was happening. By the way, we, and then you had a bad position, you changed it to a better position. By the way, we had, lost money in housing. We just didn't lose a lot. All right. Uh, in, in, the, in terms of what the government did, there's also a big question that comes up. And one, the culture of firms who were, used to be dedicated to mm -hmm. allocation of capital, the culture of firms, the other question has to do with the with Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Without what the government did, would Goldman Sachs have survived? Hard to know. I'm not sure. But the risk was enough so that I'm glad to not have tested it. Mm. And so let me, let me just take you through the sequence. In the week after Lehman Brothers fell, and that was the week in which there was a run on money market funds. That was the week that AIG was bailed out. There was um, an issue with prime brokerage activity in London. There was a lot of stresses and strains. That, the, the Monday after that week, after that Lehman Brothers, the, the week following Lehman, we went to the markets ourselves. We did a transaction with Warren Buffett in which he made a big investment in our firm. And then we went to the capital markets the next day. and sold equity in our firm and re ineffectively recapitalized ourselves. The government TARP bailout was some weeks later. So we took initiative. We weren't waiting for government action. We thought we were pretty well capitalized at the time, but we weren't taking any chances and went to private sources, Warren Buffett and the market, to recapitalize ourselves. There was still a lot of volatility, still a lot of uncertainty, and still a lot of systemic risk. If the government had not done what it did, would the system have blown up? For sure, if the system had blown up, everybody would have been in trouble, certainly us. Would that have happened? I don't know. No one will know. You can't go down two tracks. The history won't let us have two choices. We can't look back. But I will tell you, the risk, the consequences would have been so great, and the risk was so high that it was, I would say, it was critical that the government did, took the actions that it did uh, for the benefit of the system. The risk was just too high. Who would have gone under? Who wouldn't have gone under? We'll never know. But the risk was too high for everyone. At that time, did, you had no problem in terms of selling your paper. Uh, we had access to the capital. We had access to the uh, capital markets on any on every day. One day would have been better. One day would have been worse. But certainly, in the week and a half after Lehman Brothers, we certainly were able to raise equity and raise mm -hmm. preferred and raise uh, raise capital. But that still wouldn't have been a safeguard. Let me tell you, the most important thing that the government did, at least as far as we're concerned, was not the injection of the TARP money, which gets all the focus. You know, gave most banks 25. We, right. we, we were marked to market firms, so our capital needs were perceived as less. And so we got $10 billion. But we had a lot of excess. We had a lot of cash. That wasn't the most important thing for us. What was the most important thing was the general embrace of the government of the financial system, including the nine banks, that basically calmed the market down. The amount of dollars they put in was much less important. It was, only, was not important really at all for us. Well, but, or, or J.P. Morgan. But they did said, other, yeah. Or J.P. Morgan. But what they did was important for, for us and everyone else. Because? They settled the market. They stopped the run. There was a bit of a run on mm -hmm. the bank. Credit froze. People weren't lending. People were insecure what other institutions were worth. For some cases, some element of what they did on injecting capital assured people. But they also made credit available through the FDIC if you wanted to take it. They also did some activities that stabilized money market funds. And they, in general, embraced the financial system. That was critical. I'm not, by, I'm not say, by, by saying that, I'm not diminishing the consequence of the TARP. I'm just saying that other things they did at the same time were very, very consequential 
uh, and consequential to the point of criticality, mm -hmm. I think. Is there anything about the financial regulation that is being offered, um, the Dodd bill and the Volcker rules, as they even may be modified, that would be injurious to the future of Goldman Sachs? I think that it's hard to know. I, I, it, it's hard to know. The, the, it feels, the points feel fluid. I, I'm not even sure myself what's in and what's out. And even to the extent that certain words have been in for a long time, I'm not sure every element of interpretation. I could tell you that there are aspects that directionally I agree with with everything directionally, uh, maybe uh, ninety percent of, 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 of the reform of yes. Oh, for for sure, has to be reformed. But even the outline of the Dodd bill, I'm very very constructive and very positive on all the aspects. There are parts of it that, depending on how it goes, I think could could be improved. Okay, how about the Volcker rules as defined by Paul Volcker? Again, I'm not sure entirely what they would apply to, but I think that look. I think there are aspects of the Volcker rule that go too far. I don't think a in a cataclysm. Could you? What would happen to Goldman Sachs if you could no longer engage in proprietary trading? I think that if we eliminated all the activity that's unrelated to client activity at Goldman Sachs, we would probably do away with about 10% of our revenue. So you wouldn't care then? I mean, 10% is not. I care not, about. I well, care. no, but in the great scheme of things, if it's only 10% of your revenue, if that reform would only eliminate, would only reduce your revenue by 10 percent? I would care very much about the... T I work very hard for the 10 percent of our revenue, and I would say that if the activity that it would otherwise eliminate is otherwise benign activity you know. that's diversifying and doesn't create a risk for the system, then I think it's a bad idea. Well, Goldman Sachs for a long time was a partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, would it be better as a partnership today? It would be impossible to be a, a partnership today because and accomplish it's an, an accomplishment. Because as you know what the argument being made by some people, they look and said when those firms were partnerships, you know, they looked at risk differently. You know, let me say, uh, Charlie, we run the firm as a partnership. Our top 400 people we call partners. We act together. The teamwork is in the same way. Compensation for the partnership is of a certain kind of way. I, we have the compensation, and all the observers of us say, even think of it as the uh, as the partnership. But why did we stop being? But we were the last firm to give up being a partnership. We like being a partnership, but partnership does not have permanent capital. When a partner retired, he took his capital right. with him, and the firm was unstable. Companies, corporations have permanent capital. We are a big financial firm. We're not big in, just big in the United States. We're one of the biggest in every country of the world where we advise companies, help people. Help. Listen, it suits American business that we have a very big business in China that allows, you know, to help to facilitate their investments back and forth between China and the United States. These things matter. We could not do those activities unless we had a balance sheet that had permanent capital. That was why, reluctantly, with much observation and much fanfare and much regret and tears, and the firm stopped being a partnership in 1999. And, and, and the firm were opposed to it the, at uh, the time. Most people were opposed okay. to it. It was a concession to necessity. But, but uh, the question I'd ask was, when the firm was a partnership, it was much more careful about what it did and how it managed and, and how it looked at risk. I think we are... We are totally careful about how we look at risk. I think we are, frankly, our reputation is as effective risk managers. I think the whole dialogue about the question you asked me about betting and clients is a function of a, a failure to appreciate how we manage our risk. In other words, if we accumulate risk in one way, we're going to work very hard yeah. to distribute that okay, risk. But then you're saying is those kinds of transactions, while they may not be about, about allocating capital, and they may not have some societal benefit. No, no, no. They have. These are, tr these are all transactions. How did we get those tr positions in the first place? Through client positions. Let's t even within the home, where did all those positions that all those firms had? 
that lost all that money and the firm positions that we had. Those were, secure, those were holding on to securities of mortgages. Those had huge societal. How do commercial banks lend money? How do com community banks lend money to, um, you know, to their people? Remember Bailey Savings and Loan from It's a Wonderful Life? Yes. They lent out the money. And once they lent out all the money, where was the money? Remember Jimmy Stewart? It's in your home, your home, your home. Well, in modern finance, they don't just lend out the money once. After they lend out the money, the banks take those mortgages, wrap them together, and sell them to financial institutions like us who resell them to investors. The money then goes back to the banks, cash, and they lend it out and put it into new homes again. And that cycle gets repeated. Those securities are supposed to be distributed. Many people just accumulated them. And the accumulation of those securities created a lot of the excessive risk that almost tore down the system. Our process... The creation of those securities created the excessive risk that almost tore down the system. The accumulation, what, they were, what you're supposed to do, whether it's risk in mortgage-backed securities or risk in government bonds or risk in equities, is you're supposed to manage your risk. If you... The way a market maker like us works is we hold ourselves. Now, we have different levels of business. We have advisory businesses. We have asset managed businesses. We're a fiduciary. We have a market making business where we hold ourselves out to facilitate transactions that other people want to do. So if you want, we wouldn't deal with you. We deal with big institutions and big companies. If you wanted to sell something, we'd give you a price where you could buy it. If you wanted to buy something, we'd give you a price where you could sell it. Now, the way the world works, it's not like you come in to buy, somebody comes in to sell, and we match you off. Firms like us are always getting risk in one way. So, for example, if the equity market was going, it was going down, you'd be selling equities to us. Everybody in the world would be selling equities to us. We'd be accumulating equities unless we could find a place to sell it. So, at some point, before we could buy any more from you, we better find somebody else to who want to buy it. And so we keep having to lower it to a price where that person wants to buy it. That's a market-making function. And how crucial is that to your business? It's crucial to the American capital system. It's part of our business. It's one of the activities that we do. It's a very important business. But if people couldn't ha get into and out of their securities, they would never buy them in the first place. If a big company wanted to sell its bonds to finance its construction project, they'll want to sell it to you. If you thought you had to hold that security forever, whatever the fortunes of the company, if you thought you could never get your money back, if you thought, that you, whether you, if you thought you wanted to take your money out and put into something else and it would be hard to do, you wouldn't invest in the first place and they could never raise the money. The ability of the capital markets to help companies and businesses and institutions raise money when they want to, invest their money when they want to, at the core is a constant churn and movement of positions around and around, and it's the market makers that provide that access and that liquidity. The question is not whether Goldman Sachs did something illegal or not. That legality other people can sure. decide. Even President Clinton said, I'm not sure. Goldman Sachs did anything illegal. But people raise questions as to whether there was any wrongdoing. Difference in right and wrong. When they say that to you, do you understand what they're saying? No, of course, Charlie, of course I understand what they're saying. I think, listen, when I was sitting there at the Senate hearings and after having given over 20 million pieces of paper, com emails, right. conversations, and other documents, which are basically snippets and conversations. There were some email where some people were projecting, I would say, at best an indifference and at worst a callousness to the fact that we had sold something in time and maybe somebody had bought something that didn't go well and one of our clients lost money. Now, our clients didn't lose money because the security didn't do what it was supposed to do. It lost money because the security provided a certain kind of risk that the client sought, actually functioned 
the right way, but the market and the risk went, and, and, and the, and the how, in other words, people got the risk they sought. And again, when I talk about people, these were all sophisticated institutions and didn't do well. And in a couple of the email, a few of the emails that came out, there was more of an expression of relief that we didn't do badly and not a regret that a client did do badly as a result after the fact. That kind of indifference and that kind of, and as I said, callousness in some cases uh, is something that was very disturbing to me and doesn't represent... And, and where do you think it came from? Is I it just simply an, an, an ex one exception on part of an individual or do you think it had to do in the end with the kind of culture that had developed? You know, we have to be thoughtful about that and you know, some, um, I can't, I can't at this point, I can't exclude the latter. Look, we have... But, but explain that. You can't exclude the latter. I it may very well the, be, be that, uh, we're gonna have that to. there was a callousness and a sense of, of things had become blurred no, as to what one ought to do. I'd say in a particular case, in those particular things, but as I said, there's 35,000 people at the firm. There was 20 million emails. I assure you, when those emails were revealed and this was a very humbling experience, and it was very difficult. You could imagine how much fun it was sitting there, even though you know, it was appropriate that we do. But I'm sure that those emails were selected from those millions of emails because they were the worst things. I, at the core, believe that is not representative of the firm. That is not who we were. There was a selection. And do I know that those were all? But I will tell you, we're not stopping there. We're going to soul search, and we're going to look through this, and it's inexcusable if 10 people think that way or thought that way. We're going to have to be very, very introspective. And, 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 and perhaps do what? And make sure that we adjust people to understand that our fortunes, that it's not only the right thing to do, to be more aligned with the interests of your client, but that it's essential to our legitimacy and ultimately, therefore, uh, to our success. Okay, let me speak to that for a second. Legitimacy. I mean, what is at risk today for your firm in the court of public opinion and in the court of its future? I think legitimacy is a good, is a, is a good word. Because That's some people sure. have said to me, knowing you were coming here, they are at great risk. Because if their clients don't believe them, right, they're out of business. I think that's right. But I if your clients don't believe you and you lose something in this engagement that's taking place now, Goldman Sachs is at risk. Goldman, yes, we are not in a we are not in a we're not in a good place. That's for sure. Yes. But there is now discussion about a criminal suit. I've, I've read the I've read the newspaper yeah. reports. Just but that's but but that's not you know. Listen, there yeah. are a lot of. I'm telling you, it is, we hate it. I said in my, in my opening mm -hmm. statement in the Senate, it was the worst day when I received that civil suit. But it was the worst day because, in your words? It was the worst day because it was the idea that our government accused us of a fraudulent act. This was a very specific, this was, this was a specific, let me just say, this was a specific mm -hmm. case involving a specific fine... You got up the morning and the headline said, SEC no, charges... No, it was in the middle of... It was, I didn't get up in the well, morning. No, no, but you saw it the next day, too. I mean, you know. Well, I saw yeah. it the next day. By then, I'd already had it. It was, yeah. it was in the middle of the morning. I had now, I, it, was, it was stunning. It came over the screen. I saw it over the screen. I read it, and my, I, I just, my, uh, my stomach turned over. I couldn't... I, 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 was stu I, was, I was stunned. Stunned. But to your point, of course, but I would say, but we live in the... In the we live, rely on the opinions of our clients and have for 140 years. This didn't start yesterday. It didn't start last week with the lawsuit from the SEC. We are judged every day. I will tell you, this market that we're in is a lot of things, but one thing for sure, it's the most competitive market, and our clients understand what we do, and they validate us every day by doing their business with Why us. Why do you think Goldman Sachs does better than everybody else? You're the question. Why do you think Goldman Sachs does better than everybody else? I'll tell you what I assume. Yeah. I assume you hire the best people. Because we recruit and hire the best people. And more importantly, because we retain them. And the reason why we retain them and the reason why we get the best people is, and I believe this. Yeah. So you got to let me say this. 
because we get people who are really interested in doing something that they think is good for the, for the public, for the world they're in. If you look at, you mentioned earlier my predecessors who became secretaries of treasury. I could take you back and give you a hundred names. The people, we get a kind of person at Goldman Sachs who really wants to be an influential person, who wants to do something that's important, who feels that the job... Who wants to make a lot of money and then go out and do good. You know, something the people that we have don't would like to do well for themselves also. We'll but well. most of them, at the height of their careers, go into public service. I mean, the record the, the, is the record is Not just in the U.S., but all around the world, not just at the top of the firm, but in the middle of the firm. So you're saying the secret of Goldman Sachs is that they hire the right people. And we hire, right, we oh. hire the right people. Okay. And, and retain the right people. Okay. And at certain times, lose the right people and make room for other right people to come in. If you thought your resignation as CEO would make a difference in terms of the future of the firm, is that something you would do? Of course. I, well, first of all, it wouldn't even be a choice I'd have. I serve at the pleasure of a board of directors. Right. But they thought you, it was no, no, I'm, that's different. Of course, they could fire you. But I'm saying if yeah. you thought it, if you decided, would you do it? Is that what you would do? If sure. you decided that you being there, notwithstanding whether you had done anything and hadn't given great leadership, but if you thought that it was injurious for the firm for you to stay as CEO, you would leave. Yes, I, I, I serve the interests of the firm. The firm is not there for my benefit. The firm, the firm is not there for my benefit. I'm there for the, I'm there to, I'm, I'm there in service of the and firm. And so what's the challenge for Goldman Sachs today to move beyond this? Well, the, the, the challenge... I know you've got to meet legal actions and you have to respond by... Sure. And by the way, the firm is... Listen, this is a big preoccupation for me and big preoccupation for a lot of members of yeah. our management group. But... But you have no choice. But, and we have no choice... But 35,000 people of Goldman Sachs are coming into the office every day and helping to manage people's money, advising companies on how to grow, helping to raise capital right. for them, helping companies in the United States expand overseas. We're work, you know, in other words, the, I'm living in this world, you know, this week, you know what my schedule was yes. this week and how much time I'm spending on these matters, but I would say... The overwhelming preponderance of the firm are serving their interests of the client, uh, you know, are working their 17 or 19 hour days serving the interests of their clients, and that's going on right now. So that's all that is going through. What do you have to do, and what does Goldman Sachs have to do? The challenge is, is that to we get have, back. We have to, um, we have a lot of work to do. We are, we are in a hole, I think. The hole is what? I want you to define the hole I for me. I think that. There is a lot of resentment and anger over the financial crisis, of which a partial cause was financial institutions, of which, and, uh, and that is a community of which we are a member. And, and, and I, the most prominent. The most prominent. I, th I don't think we did anything uniquely wrong as far as financial institutions so are concerned. So, in other words, you're saying whatever we did it might be considered wrong, everybody else was doing it. But we're bigger, and, we're pro and, 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 and we want to be a leader. And we're prominent, and we are a leader. We want, listen, yesterday, you know, Wednesday, I didn't particularly want to be a leader when I was sitting in front of the Senate. We yes. are a leader, like it or not, and most of the time we like it, and so obligations come with that. And so we have our share of responsibility, yeah. maybe more than our share, but at the same time, it seems a bit disproportionate that we're, we are the firm that probably managed our risks very well and that we have a disproportionate share yeah. of all the burden that financial institutions in the United States and around the world should have to mm -hmm. take for this. So, so I don't claim nothing. It's not a matter of fairness, but it's a matter of proportionality. The challenge that we have is to repair that reputation. And the, one of the complexity that we have, and maybe this is an oversight of us, it's our own fault, but for 140 years, Goldman Sachs is an institutional firm. We transact with corporations, big institutions, government, states, where we buy bonds from yeah. the United States government. Who don't we deal with? For the most part, we don't deal with the American public. Right. We don't have banks on the street corner. We don't right. do credit cards. We don't have checking accounts. We're not involved in the lives. The things that we do that support the American economy, that at the core, 
We're a very important catalyst for economic growth when you think of the money we raise for industries, the tech firms we take public, the bonds we raise to finance. We're very important, but the public doesn't see that the way they see their credit card company and the place where they get their mortgage. We don't do that. So for 140 years, we didn't focus yeah, but, yeah, I know, I know, on the American. Look, now we have to take a damaged reputation with the American without the contact with the American public to build on. And that's a, you asked me what the big so challenge is. That's why you're here and that's why you... That's a huge challenge. I would to say it's my deficiency. But how often have you seen me on television? On, on, on general interest news shows prior Never. to this. You know something? What? That was probably a mistake, but now it's, you, you see that we have a lot of work to do explaining to people what it is that we do, and we're starting from a hole. Here's what one person said to me. Has there ever been a time, this is a respected journalist in, in the world of finance, that, has there ever been that's a time... A, that's, a, that's a redundant respected <laughs> journalist. <laughs> and you were looking for that, yes. right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Has there ever been a time when Goldman's investment advisors bought securities from Goldman for a client, and at the same time, Goldman was simultaneously shorting it? We're sh I have to explain. See, this is, this is a problem. As a market maker, we are making buying and selling a thousand times a minute, of co pro probably. That's what I. That's what I. That's the detach, and that's why. Okay, but I mean, is that, but see, that's the question. But you're saying that's our business, and other people are saying, is not, that? It, it, should that? No, but let me. I mean, I, your, your answer always was before the cap, here at this table and before the Senate. You know, that's who we are. We are a market no. maker, so we are buying over here and shorting over here and investing over here. No, 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 no. Stop, over stop, 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 stop. Advising opportunity, advising is where people are coming to us for advice. On mergers and acquisitions right. and Let raising explain. capital. Right. That is an activity where people are asking us for our opinion, where we have an obligation and a duty and relationship. And I'm not talking about law. I'm no. talking about people's expectations. That's what we're talking about. When we are explaining our market maker, somebody's saying, what's the price on IBM? What's the price on this? What's the price? Simultaneously, someone's buying, someone's selling. A thousand times. We, they're not asking us for our opinion. We're not providing. We are simultaneously sell by, buy, sell, sell by. Think of the New York Stock Exchange. Right. Let's make believe we were the New York Stock Exchange. That's a market. Right. Like it a is. market maker. Ask the question, and instead of Goldman, use the word New York Stock Exchange. Right. Can someone go to the New York Stock Exchange? Buy a security the same time they're sell and at the same time they're selling the security. No, to they need else. someone to help them do it. A market maker. Uh, let me ask you a question. Can the New York or State, dealer, would the is. New York Stock Exchange sell you the security and simultaneously buy it from someone else? Would they? Yes. Of course. That's what a market maker does all day long. It's just we're like a machine that lets yeah. people buy yeah. and sell what they want to buy and sell. That's not the advisory business. That's just a facility for market making. That's what has. That's what the detaches, and I'm telling you... That, oh, the detach meaning that's where the breakdown in understanding yes. Goldman Sachs is, and that's Not where... Not Goldman Sachs, every firm like us. Yeah, but you're the one under scrutiny right now. We're under scrutiny, but that doesn't mean we're the, we're the firm. Okay. In other words, we have the burden of explaining it, but in any way, that's okay. what I'm saying. So if you just used, instead of... All right, but let, let me make the question. Issue. Can you imagine circumstances in which that would be wrong? I think it would be... In a sense where you're shorting something that you are advising somebody to do something. Not I mean, advising. Okay. Again, All right. it's, a different, it's a different thing. We Can are, you imagine? I'm trying to get at this notion why people have a perception... We are not working against that whole, the... Every senator up there had some perception that there was wrongdoing. And it wasn't just about the SEC suit either. It was somehow there's something going on. That's one argument. The other argument they were making, other people were making, and I think some friends of yours... Let me ask it. you. If you went into, again... Who, we deal, who are, by the way, who is this market? The biggest institutions, mutual funds. Could you imagine a market where somebody came in? The trades that get done are hundreds of millions, if not billions of trades a day. This is, not a, this is just a facility for being the other okay. side of what people okay, wanted to do. Anyway. No, but let me just ask you that. Yes. I mean, since you mentioned that, in terms of putting together securities, you know, and, and if, if, if the people... 
who were buying those, these very sophisticated people you were talking about, if they knew, if they knew that Goldman or people who helped put the securities together believed they were going to fail, we would, would, they have, would, they, would they have bought them or not? No, no, if they believed they would fail, they wouldn't buy it. If we believed it would fail, if we the security would not wouldn't work, we would not sell it. If, if you believe that a bundle of securities you had put together were going to decline in value, no, fail. That's, no, no, the, oh, you want no, to that's, that's, no, that's very important. Okay. We, look, the equity markets, do you think the equity markets are going up or down? from here. We just went up 70%. Do, do, what do I think? What do you think? No, I, th I think things are going to go up because I believe in America. That's sort of Me too. Okay. But I don't know. But let's say I thought they were going to go down. I mean, I think we're coming out of economic recovery. And I thought you buying, a, you buying an instrument right. that buying equity would lose you money, I would sell that to you. That's not failure. Right. A security that would fail is a security that was not going to work the way you wanted it to work. In other words, the basis of markets is that everybody makes a decision in the profession in the, yeah. in the way markets work is that you want to get a risk that you want if you understand the risk and you're suitable to take that risk um, the new york stock exchange doesn't ask who you are or what you think or what the new york stock exchange opinion is you could buy that risk uh, i we would never we would let you buy a tech stock even if we had an opinion that tech stocks were going to go down that's not our business. You're not looking for our opinion for that. You're looking to buy a technology stock, and you know what you want to buy, and you come to okay, us but, and but, sell Okay, it. but suppose... Oh, yeah, but if oh, you were oh. going to buy something that wasn't going to work, that you yeah. thought you were buying the stock and the company was, was a bad company, and it wasn't going to deliver, or it was a... Or it was uh, the security wasn't going to do what you thought it right, was. Right. We wouldn't sell okay, it to but, you. But, but, uh, okay, maybe that's what I'm asking. That's what you may just have answered it. Suppose I'm at Morgan Stanley. I'm going to sell you a security... Uh, because I believe I believe it's going to go up. Like, does, oh, yes. All right. I believe, I'm going to sell you a security, and and I'm you're believing it's going to go up. At the same time, some somewhere else in Goldman Sachs, we're shorting that same security. There's no problem there in your job. No problem at all. That's no. just the nature that, of making markets. That's the nature of markets. We don't even. Know, by the way, we wouldn't even know. First of all, a you might have your own opinion. B, if somebody at Goldman Sachs is selling that security, they might plan to buy it back in two seconds. You might be investing in that security yeah. for five years. You don't know. The, in other words, we, are, we have rows and rows of people who are answering people's requests to buy and sell securities all day. They're not going around and say, what was the last trade, long or short? The market wouldn't work. But you're also saying we would not go out and advise somebody to buy a security at the same time we're shorting it, or that doesn't bother you either? Again... Yeah, you, know, you know, again, I don't want to get trapped in the technical in, uh, in these things, not. but that's not how a market, the, the market makers work. When we are advising, then we have a fiduciary obligation and a duty, and it's, mm. I'm not talking, it mm. happens to be a legal expression, mm. but it's also the ethics of the market. When we are just a facility to facilitate other people's transactions, mm. they're not asking us our okay. opinion, and they wouldn't care about what, we, what some other trader down the three seats away did or didn't do. Here is what I believe you were saying about the housing crisis, and correct me, in term, that, that was at the core of the subprime crisis and the, and the housing bubble, was at the core of a global economic meltdown, correct? I, yes, it was at the core. It probably wasn't the only thing at okay. the core. And what it might you, not have even been the first cause. What was the first cause? A gen, if you want to make it more, more general, there was a general over-leveraging okay, of everything. Uh, okay. The housing was a symptom of it, right. but it wasn't... Cre Consumer credit was over leveraged. The federal government was over leveraged. Corporations had borrowed too much. Everybody money. had lost. There everybody. was too much debt, and everybody had lost sight including of housing, risk. Everybody lost sight of risk. Including housing, not limited to housing. Okay, how would you fix that so that we don't do that again? Well, I can tell you we can improve our chances of not doing it again. Because it's reducing risk. There are a number of things that we're going to do. But if you will not, you will not absolutely rule out excess. You can pass a law against excess, mm -hmm. and somewhere down the road, some excess will appear at some point from some direction, and no one will know it at the time, and everyone will know it in hindsight. But some of the reforms that are being talked about today will improve the chances of having a le making it less likely to happen. So, for example, 
a systemic regulating council, right. people to look out around corners and say, where are these excesses picking? Right. Maybe I won't see all of them, but maybe I'll see more than we would have thought before. How about before. a consumer protection aspect? A consumer protection aspect to in, make sure in, that doesn't build up in consumers. Right. Derivative legislation to make sure that leverage doesn't and come. Transparency. Exchange. Those are all things designed. That you're in favor of. Of course. Those are all things. We well, say it easy, but, but you know, the, the characterization is that the Wall Street is down there lobbying against it all the time, as you know, spending millions of dollars. You know, Wall Street, just like academics, right. just like corporations, are in, not only, you, you think I'm saying entitled, I'm going to so further, are invited by staffs of legislators, can you explain this to me, can you explain that to me, what are the consequences of this? If we pass this rule, could please people tell me what you think the consequences, good or bad? So let me tell you, if you call it, of co if you call it lobbying all the time, you have one image of it. Maybe there's excessive uh, petitioning and it turns into that. But I will tell you, even in the Senate hearing that we had, there was a lot of entreaties by the senators to say, I hope you will work with us to pass the right rules, right, and not right, the wrong right. rules, and to work with us. What do you think that means? That means going in and giving, okay, making but recommendations you, but you're and you're not going to sit here and suggest, I don't think, though, that all lobbying is simply trying to explain and help them. Fact. No, but all lobbying isn't invidious, right, and a lot absolutely. of it is explained. Exactly. No, okay. But, I mean, it, it depends on what... Yes, it explains, you know, sometimes expo yeah. it, yes. So, but you're in favor of the Dodd Bill, then. Is that what I hear you saying? I'm in favor, but the Dodd Bill is still being, you know, I'm in favor of a, frankly, right. I'm in favor of a bipartisan bill. Right. Which will which incorporate the bulk of the Dodd Bill, yeah. but elements of refinement to it. Okay. So I'm in favor of, the bi of a bipartisan bill. Mm -hmm. But as we, we, we started ticking through it, some of those things in the bill are designed to make a, a, um, a bubble less likely, some of those things are designed to make the consequence of being caught up in a bubble less dangerous, like having extra capital to absorb losses when they occur. And some of the things in the bill are designed that if everything else fails, let's make sure the consequences of failure aren't so great again. Mm -hmm. And that's the resolution authority, ending the too big to fail element. So there's a number of elements in that bill that let's avoid the problem, let's make sure we could absorb the problem, and if we can't, and if one and two fail, yeah. let's make sure we can, you know, put a company out of business in a way that won't affect the whole system. Those are three very important elements, and of course, consumer legislation is very important. Now, we happen not to be a consumer firm, so we have less to say about it and less experience with it, so we tend to talk about it less. But obviously, consumer legislation in, 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 in some mm -hmm. form is essential as well. You think the country is headed in the right direction in terms of, and the president, in terms of what he's trying to do about the economy, about jobs, about in, in a whole range of issues that affect the economy and the economic recovery of the country? I think, I think there's well, consensus around the direction. I think most of the debate, even though the debate is strenuous and at times to somebody who does you know who's not used to you know is not as a keen observer as some other people looks you know sometimes aggressive and bitter but if you look at the actual issues i think the directions in which both parties are going in are pretty are pretty consistent and a lot of dispute and a lot of disagreements are around a uh, small percentage of the whole outline now, they have consequences, and some of these things may be worth fighting for, but I'd say on the whole, um, most of it, they're, they're uh, quite consistent in the direction. Goldman Sachs will survive? Oh, for sure. Th th thrive. Thrive. Lloyd Blankfein will survive? L Lloyd Blankfein will, yeah, I'll be here. <laughs> As CEO of Goldman Sachs? That's my, that's my, that's my expectation, and that's my, um, that's my, that's my duty. And I, and, I, and I feel that. And Goldman Sachs, a year from now, be essentially the same company that it is today, doing the same things. Goldman Sachs, I don't think, has ever been the same company two years in a row, ever, in any moment. We are always evolving. Mm -hmm. Look, in the last 10, right. 15 years, we went from a private company to a public company, a mostly U.S. company to a global company, right. a most a, a big a small balance sheet to a big balance sheet uh, pr we a, a private partnership to not a private partnership we're always evolving 
to meet the needs of the markets and our clients. And we will continue to evolve in order to accomplish that. There is misunderstanding in terms of the functions of Wall Street, in terms of how people have been hurt, yes. in terms of, of a whole... You, you, are you agreeing with me? Or? I'm agreeing and I want to add something because I don't want to leave you. It's n all the misunderstandings aren't on the other side. We have soul search. In other words, we, I sat there and it wasn't just trying to parry every thrust. There are things for, when I say we have to evolve and we have to take into account, we have to read these things and that the callousness of some of the emails I listen to, which I don't think are representative, but were still there, we have to make adjustments also. And I, 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 if, I, if, I leave, if, if your summary, if you were done with your summary, then I've done a bad job of telling you that we are listening also and that we know we have to make changes. There are ways in which I have to do a better job of informing people about markets and what we do and the contribution we make. But it's not one way. We, let me tell you, there are a lot of, in, there, there's, we're getting a lot of communication these days and we have to be awfully thick. Not to ha not to pick it up, and so we are going to have to and go. And not to say that this what that we have to change. Yes, yes, that's what I'm. But saying. I don't understand. I really don't. Even if the, you know, you mentioned the emails, and clearly, if that represents something, that, if that represents something, Goldman Sachs, we want to do something to make sure it's not. But I mean, what is it Goldman Sachs has to do to change? I still don't understand. I think we have to engage more. We might have to. Well. We'll look at all of our business practices, but we have to do more about examining the cross currents and we have to look at the conflicts inherent, by the way, inherent in a business where you're a go-between between buyers and sellers, people who need to invest money and people who need those investments. We're always intermediating in our business between interests that are in conflict and we help to resolve those conflicts but in some ways we've taken those conflicts on ourselves the conflicts themselves aren't a bad thing because they're buyers and sellers they have to meet the buyer wants it to go up the seller wants it to go down there's an inherent conflict but we have to do a better job of being transparent and examining our processes to make sure that the society is in tune to the way in which we're making our decisions on those outcomes. And I, and I, I, I know it sounds, it's not as concrete as you'd like it to be, or as, as I'd like it to be, but we're, I'm just indicating to you that we're going to have to go through our processes with a view to, not, to making people appreciate in a more positive way what we're doing. We can't, we can't, we can't exist in, this, in the current state that we're in. And we understand that. And so we have a lot of work to do. The perception, and, and, you know, and I think you just spoke to that better than I've ever heard you say that. Um, the perception, too, beyond an individual transaction is that they're all, Wall Street is making a ton of money in transactions that, A, people don't understand, or, B, they don't have economic benefit, that it's become one great big casino in which a bunch of selected people have gotten rich. I think, you know, we touched on this before. Sure. You can characterize anything as a bet. You can call it a casino. People call futures markets. Okay. They call the stock exchange a casino. Is the stock exchange a casino? Well, people can make and people can lose, but really there's an extraordinary social purpose in allowing people to take, to... To bet on anything. To... Think of it. You can characterize it that way, and some people did characterize it that way. But to take a risk or to hedge a risk. Look, if I'm an auto company and I want to build plant and equipment in South America, I might not do it if I can't hedge that currency. If I'm trying to, if I'm trying to dig an oil, if I'm trying to finance right. an offshore oil well, well, that oil well may work if oil is trading at $80. If I could sell the oil that comes out of the ground or out of the ocean at $80 a barrel, but if it comes out at $40 a barrel, I'll go bankrupt. So no one will give me financing unless what? 
unless I can lock in the price of oil at $80 right. a barrel. So I'm going to go to a market. I'm going to go to Goldman Sachs and say, I'd like to sell oil forward at $80 a barrel. Is that person betting on the price of oil? I guess you could say that. But what is that person really doing? They're hedging a risk that will allow that company to go out and invest $10 billion in extracting oil out of the market. That person is selling oil, but as a result of selling oil forward, what does the world get? It gets more oil because now that person will invest in digging that well, and prior to that, they wouldn't be able to invest in digging the well because they don't know what the price of oil will be in seven years. Now, in order to do that, you really need somebody to be on the other side. Who's going to buy that oil seven years forward? It could be another client. It could be somebody who uses oil. It could be a speculator. It could be Goldman Sachs taking the other side. But there's a real social purpose in doing that. This idea of transferring risk has a very big, you could call it a casino, but if it is, it's a very socially important casino. Thank you again. Lord Blankfein, CEO of Goldman Sachs, as I said. Um, there is, we're talking about an area in which a lot of people uh, have a lot of misunderstandings or an absence of understanding, and, and it is complex. Uh, it is difficult, and uh, we hope that this advanced at least some the idea of what is taking place and, and, uh, and how some of this has fallen on the shoulders of Goldman Sachs.